Good morning, everyone. We welcome you today to the wonderful Lake Hamilton Baptist Church, where we gather every Lord's Day for worship here at 10 o'clock, and we're glad that you could make it today. If you're visiting with us today, you're our special guest. We're glad that you're with us in worship, and if it's your first visit, please take just a few minutes during the service to fill out the welcome card that's in front of you and put that in the offering plate, and you can make that your offering to us today. We don't want our guests to feel pressured to give any money to the church. We extort that from our members. But uh, we'd love to have your uh, welcome card if you could uh, do that. We also want to welcome those who are watching by way of live stream today. We have several homebound members who enjoy that service every Sunday. And today, your pastor's wife, Andrea, is watching by live stream from Atlanta, Georgia, where she's babysitting our grandchildren. And Andrea, as you're watching, I, tell you, I promise I have not been to Popeye since you left. <laughs> Yet. Also, if you have been visiting and you're interested in membership in our church, we'd love to have you. We have a membership class coming up on the last Saturday this month, Saturday morning from 9 to about 11.30. You can sign up on our website or you can send me an email or text or just tell me that you'd like to come and we'll include you in that uh, membership class so that you can enjoy the blessings and responsibilities of Christian church uh, membership. As we begin this morning in prayer, we uh, pray every Wednesday for the nation of Israel and for peace in the Middle East. We Christians have an obligation to the Jews. After all, our Lord and Savior was Jewish according to the flesh. And because they gave to us Jesus, we give to them, the nation of Israel, our love and our support both politically and spiritually. And so we'll reference that in our morning prayer as we start our worship here momentarily. And as we do, let me offer you grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also to you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's a great thing to worship you, especially if we know you and worship as part of our lifestyle, our, our life service to you. And I'm so grateful for the many sincere Christians that make up the membership of this body. This is a unique church. You've made it so, Father. And for the level of commitment and faithfulness amongst our members, I give you thanks. So many, most of them are here this morning. Others are watching by live stream. We thank you for our church those that you've added to her in recent days and those that you will add in the days to come. May we always love you supremely. May we always love one another as you've commanded us in scripture. And may we spread and share your love through the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ across this community and across this world continually. We're grateful for our freedom and pleasure and safety as we gather here and as we do gather, we think about those who live in Israel and the Middle East we pray for peace there, Father. It's so volatile. There's so much hatred and strife, and there's so much, it seems to us, unnecessary attacks against the nation of Israel, especially in recent days. So we pray for their protection, and we pray for peace. And we pray that the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, would reign in theirs and in our hearts forever. And all this and more we pray in Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Answer me when I call, O oh God, of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayers. O oh men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the, God, the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts your beds and be silent. Selah, offer right sacrifices and put your trust into the Lord. Psalms 4, 1 through 5. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Our opening hymn is number 129. Crown him with many crowns. Crowns in the Bible are symbols of power and victory and honor and royalty. Jesus' ultimate authority and kingship over creation cannot be recognized by just one crown, but many, as referenced in Revelation 19.12, when Jesus is pictured as wearing many diadems or crowns. As we sing, please notice that there are five crowns mentioned in this hymn. Uh, this is only five of 12 verses of this hymn. There are other crowns mentioned in some of the other verses. But in these verses, the crown of the Lamb upon the throne, 
the crown of the Son of God and Son of Man, the crown of love, the crown of life, and the crown of Lord of Lords. In other stanzas, he wears the crown of peace and the crown of heaven. The music is very stately and regal, worthy of a coronation that we bestow with our voices as we stand and sing. <laughs> Our next scripture reading will be from the uh, book of Isaiah, and uh, it's uh, chapter 25, verse 1 through 5, uh, if you'd like to follow along. Uh, o Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's place is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, 
a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is number 80, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, written by Stuart Townend in 1995. Stuart Townend had written a lot of what we would call worship songs in a contemporary style, and he felt it was time to write a true hymn. And he had been meditating on the cross and what it cost the Father to give up his beloved Son to a torturous death on that cross. And then he contemplated about his own part in it and realized that it was his sin and your sin and my sin that put Christ there. It just makes his sacrifice all the more personal, the more amazing, and the more humbling. Let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> I will be reading from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. And when Peter saw that he had, and when, Peter, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to worship you in spirit and truth, to hear your word, to hear preaching of your word. We thank you for all the blessings that you give us. You're so gracious to us. And Lord, as we think about these things, Lord, we just ask you to give us also generous hearts that we give abundantly and that we can sow abundantly for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
In the days of the Old Testament, God made a promise to the nation of Israel, a promise to give them a great gift, the great gift of salvation. And this eternal salvation would be by God's grace through faith, faith in God, and in the promised Messiah that God would bring to the world to be our suffering servant and our sin bearer. This promise was not only for the nation of Israel, but it was to be a light to all the nations of the earth. And in the new covenant, in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read about the fulfillment of this promise that salvation came to the world through the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And in the book of Romans that we've been traveling through for many a Sunday morning now, this promise of salvation in the old covenant, this presentation of salvation in the new covenant is explained for us in this beautiful epistle from Paul originated to the Christian church in Rome and by the Holy Spirit to all the churches of all time. And in the book of Romans, as we've been making progress, we have learned many synonyms, many names that are synonymous with salvation. We've looked at justification. Justification is salvation on the front end when you first come to know and love and belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about sanctification. Sanctification is another word for salvation. If you're a saved person, you are a sanctified person. And we began to peek a little bit in chapter 8 into glorification. Glorification is a word for utter salvation. That's at the end of our time or the time when Christ returns and we are with him in glory in heaven and we will be forever and ever and ever. There are other words in Romans as well, redemption, regeneration. But there's another word that's used for the first time here in the book of Romans that is a wonderful word. It's a glorious word. It's a loving word. It's a heroic word. And it's a word that also is synonymous with salvation. It is the word adoption. Adoption. If you're a child of God, that means that you have been adopted by God. Adoption is a very intentional choice on the part of a parent, and it is a supreme blessing to any boy or girl who gets adopted most often from difficult or negative circumstances into more positive and blessed and hopefully even saving circumstances. Adoption is near and dear to my heart for many reasons, not the least of which is that I'm the pastor to some very special people and families that have chosen sacrificially and lovingly to take the route of adoption to better a young person's life. I thought by way of introduction that I might introduce these families to the congregation. You probably know them already, and I've asked their permission is not to put them on the spot or embarrass them in any way. But we have several adoptive parents and adopted kids that make up the membership and worshipers of Lake Hamilton Baptist Church. I'm going to ask them to stand one at a time by family. Mike and Rita Smith, would you guys and Brody stand and just remain standing? Mike and Rita Smith made the choice to adopt Brody from a difficult situation that his birth parents were experiencing at the time to give him better parents and a better life and a better destiny, especially as believers in Jesus Christ. And they're not the only ones. Uh, the Cadells, Paul and Wendy, fostered Cortland. You three stand, please. They were foster parents who fell in love with this little child who came from some difficult circumstances far beyond her control. And lovingly, they adopted us, their own daughter, and they're raising her up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. As you all know, Jeff and Stacy Bonds are in the process. Y'all keep standing now because you're going to get embarrassed here in a minute. <laughs> Jeff and Stacy, we, we know much about their story. It's been lived out so publicly before us, but Lute and Mary Jane and Santiago Jack are in the process of being loved and cared for and hopefully adopted by this parents. We have others too. Sumner, Sumner Young is adopted by his father, Bo. They're not with us this morning. Uh, Ruth and Tony Thomas, foster parented, gave adoptive parenting love to many children through their years and lifetime. But I think adoptive parents are heroes, and I think adopted children are blessed. And so I wanted us to kind of recognize them for that this morning. God bless you and be with you, and thank you for your love. There's one more adopted person in the congregation today, but I'm going to save his or her identity for the end of the sermon. For now, I want to take you to our text, which is Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. And in the, the middle of the text, you can circle that word adoption. Actually, the phrase in verse 15 is the spirit of adoption as sons. 
And as per usual, it takes five English words to tell you what two Greek words uh, can say. And in the original biblical language, the phrase is spiritual adoption. What Paul is talking about here is salvation. He's talking to those of us who have it by the grace of God through faith in him. And he calls it specifically in this text spiritual adoption. So this sermon then would be about spiritual adoption beginning with verse 12. So then, my Christian brothers and sisters, we are debtors. We have an obligation. We owe not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. I mean eternally. But if by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you've been regenerated and you put to death the deaths, uh, to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. You are living and you will live forever and ever and ever. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, or you have received spiritual adoption, by whom we can now cry out to God and call him Abba, Father, Daddy, Personal, Loving, Father. And then the Spirit himself bears witness, gives us assurance with our spirit that we are the adopted children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him, that we share his suffering, that we share his passion, in order that we may be glorified forever with him. This is the word of the Lord. Now, it may come as bad news to some of you kids here this morning, but generally speaking, kids turn out to be a lot like their parents. If you've got good-looking parents, you're going to be a good-looking kid. If your parents, not so much, you turn out to look like me. Not just in their appearance, but in their attitudes and eventually their actions as well. Children born to good and godly parents, of uh, reasonably good education and intellect, uh, with marketable skills, tend to do well in life. Children from not so fortunate parents, whose parents struggle with addiction or dereliction or constant depravity or even drugs or alcohol addiction, they often turn out not so good. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule. There are exceptions to good kids that are brought up in good homes who turn out to be prodigals. And sometimes the prodigals from Christian homes, well, they never come home. They belittle the proverb, they bend the parable, and they break our hearts. And it does happen. Bad kids can come from good homes. Conversely, there are many of children that are born into problematic circumstances, unfortunate circumstances, with parents who are not responsible, not good who get rescued from that scenario and transferred over into a good home where they can turn out good through the grace of adoption. Adoptive parents are overwhelmingly Christian in our society. They adopt out of a labor of love, out of labor of concern, out of a sacrifice, knowing that if they'll give up some of their life to be parents or parents again, then the child that they adopt out of bad circumstances has a good chance of turning out in a good and hopefully godly way. So adoption on earth is a beautiful picture, really, to us, a beautiful parallel of adoption in heaven. We pray, God, in heaven as it is on earth, and sometimes these earthly adoptions give us a beautiful picture of what happens to us when we become uh, Christians. And so this text that Paul writes, he uses the term adoption for the first of five times in the New Testament. Adoption was not a a long-standing institution in human history. It's actually a new part of Greco-Roman culture that has existed for about two or 2,500 years. And Paul uses it here not to talk about little adoption that we do celebrate, especially us this morning, but to talk about what happens when a person receives the great gift of salvation. It, it, It truly is a grace of God where, where things get better for you because of adoption. You have better parents, spiritual parents. You have a better life, a better quality and quantity of life, and you have a better legacy because if you've been adopted by God, then your life will never, never end and have a glorious, glorious finish. And as I looked at this paragraph about adoption, I've sort of broken it down along those three lines. Adoption gives us better parents, 
It gives us, therefore, a better life, and it results in a better destiny for all who have been born again and belong to God through the grace of adoption. First of all, adoption gives you better parents. The strongest influence on a child, bar none, is their parents. I've already established that in our introduction. Now, this is not specifically parental influence that Paul is talking about here, but he's talking about strong influence that influences how all of us turn out. And in the text here, he says these two influences are the flesh and the spirit. In other words, if you live according to the flesh, if you let the flesh influence you and dominate your thinking and your life, then your life is going to have a tragic ending because you're going to die and go to hell for eternity. But if you're influenced by the Spirit, if you live according to the Spirit, and you put to death the deeds of the flesh, then you will live. You will live better in this life, and you will live forever in the life to come. So I sort of uh, parallel those two influences into uh, parental influences, one being negative and one being very positive. Now, the natural influence in our life as human beings is bad. It comes from three very negative sources who I would consider to be an unholy trinity of of bad parentage. And those three negative forces, Paul mentions one, but there are three in the Bible. One is the world, the second is the flesh, and the third is the very real and living devil. You scan the New Testament, and if you want to look for bad influences upon human beings' life, they come from those three parents, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, Paul warns us about the world in other places. In Romans 12, 2, he says, Be not conformed to this world. And what he means by that is the, is the world system, the anti-Christian, anti-religious uh, system that is opposed to God and to the Word of God and tries to squeeze human beings into its mold. Be not conformed. Be not squeezed into the mold of this world because the world, apart from God, is a very negative parental-type influence upon our life. And then the second is the flesh. Paul mentions that one specifically. Don't live according to the flesh. Don't let the flesh influence you in a dominant way of the way you live your life and make your decisions. And, of course, what Paul means by the flesh is not our flesh and blood and skin and whatnot. He's talking about our depraved nature, our our human nature, which is fallen and which is depraved and which is bent toward rebellion against God and not doing the things that God commends in his word. These are the bad parents in, in our lives, naturally, the world, the flesh. And he doesn't mention him specifically here in this text, but let's throw the devil in for good measure. There are at least 12 scriptures in Pauline Rise of the New Testament that warn us about the devil. He is very real. He's very cunning. He's very deceptive. Uh, he gets into our mind. He brings temptation into our life. And, uh, and for the fact of the matter is, according to scripture, according to Jesus, uh, when you're, if you are a lost person, then the devil is literally your parent. It's a shocking thing to think about, so I'll let you absorb that for a minute. But if you don't believe me, just go to John chapter 8 and look at one of the many dialogues between our Lord Jesus Christ and his chief enemies during his earthly ministry, which were, of course, the Pharisees. We don't like them. He wasn't speaking just to Pharisees in John chapter 8. He was speaking to any and every lost person who has ever lived. And Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, because of the way they were living, because of the way they were opposing Christ and opposing Christianity, he said, and I quote, you are of your father, the devil. The devil is a bad parental influence upon every lost person who has ever lived. And so if you are lost, that's just the way you live. You live according to the world, seeking out worldly fortune and fame. You live according to your flesh, feeding your flesh with excessive food, drink, sex, whatever it can enjoy. And whether you know it or not, you're following your father who is the devil. That is a very, very bad life that culminates in a very, very bad ending. But with spiritual adoption, see, what happens when a person receives salvation is they are spiritually adopted. And they are taking from that bad trio of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they are adopted by a holy trinity of parentage, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
That's the family you want to be adopted into. When you are adopted as a son or a daughter of God, when you are saved, when you are justified by grace through faith in Jesus, then God becomes your father, not the devil anymore, not the world, not your own flesh and lust, but the, God is your father in this text. Paul says that when you receive the spirit of adoption, you can call out, you can cry out, there's a strong affinity here, you can call God your Abba Father. And you've heard this in a gazillion Bible studies. The word Abba is Aramaic word, which translated into English would just mean daddy. We all have fathers. You know, I've known a few real rich folks in my life. You ever said rich folk, they call their, their dad father. <laughs> but we, we plan on poor folks, we call him daddy. You know. <laughs> but what, what, what he's talking about there is that when you're adopted, you now, you didn't have this before, but you now have a personal relationship with almighty God. He is high and holy. He is lifted up. He is perfect. He is perfection. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He is powerful. He is the God of all the universe. And if you're saved through adoption, he's your daddy. And you can talk to him just like you would in a good relationship on earth with your earthly father, just like you would because you personally belong to him. So now you have the first person of the Trinity now giving you parental influence. You have the second person of the Trinity giving you influence as well because Jesus Christ's Son is your Lord. He's your leader. He's your brother. He's your friend. And you are now a joint heir with Jesus means you own everything that Jesus owns. You don't even need a lottery ticket for that. I mean, think about it. You own everything that Jesus owned in this life, and you're going to own everything that Jesus owns in the life to come. Now, in this life, Jesus owned suffering. And we're going to say a little bit about that more in a minute. But what an honor it is to suffer for Jesus in this life. And in the life to come, I don't know what heaven's going to be like. Our eyes have never seen it. Our ears haven't heard about it. We can't even imagine how wonderful it's going to be when we see heaven and all of its splendor and glory and, and all the fullness of it. And it's, it's ours we're adoptive kids of the Father. We are co-heirs with Christ, and so everything that is His is ours too. What a family to be adopted in. And then you have the third person of the Trinity as well, the Spirit who really made it all possible, the unsung third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicted you of your sin and your lostness and your worldliness and that you are following the devil instead of God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who converts you and regenerates your heart. And the Holy Spirit is the one who puts the seal of adoption on you and makes it legal and makes it personal and spiritual in your life. He is the agent of spiritual adoption whereby you lose those terrible parents that you used to have, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and you now belong to God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Better parents. Better parents through spiritual adoption that gives you a better life. Now, I decided I have to be honest in all my preaching, so I'm going to be honest here now. If you are serving the world, the flesh, and the devil, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a terrible life. Matter of fact, you might have a very good life, a very rich life, a very fun life. Worldly fortune and fame can be fun. I'm sure I never really had it. But it can be fun uh, for a season until the season runs out. And feeding your flesh with excessive food, drink, or sex, or whatever you may do, uh, can give you a good feeling, at least temporarily. And if you sell your soul to the devil, you can play that guitar real good. <laughs> or rule Wall Street. Or be a movie star. I mean, people do it all the time, not like the movies per se. But if you're not giving yourself to God, well, then you're giving yourself to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, and again, and it could be all right for, for a little while, but that life eventually crashes and burns. Through the years, I've, I've, I like to go to art galleries. I, I like the gallery walk we have here in Hot Springs and you know, poster galleries and stuff like that. There, there's a recurring portrait that I've seen all of my adult life, and it's the same four people in all these portraits. It's always Humphrey Bogart and Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley, and James Dean. Have you seen it? Some, sometimes they're in a, a cafe, you know, a midnight cafe. Uh, sometimes uh, they're playing poker, you know. 
just different scenarios. But it's always the same four people. And, and of course, what, what they are is that they are, they are the epitome of a worldly life. I mean, they, this was, was a few people more famous in the 20th century than those four, and, and they're among those four is who most people in America would want to, uh, would want to live their kind of life if, if they, they could. So it's, it's not a, a bad life. There's just a better life to be had. And it is a bad life, though, in the way it turns out, is it not? I mean, Bogart drank and smoked himself to a cancerous death, Marilyn Monroe took an overdose of sleeping pills to end her still young life. Elvis died on the throne in Graceland because he excessively used uh, drugs. And James Dean, when it was found out and made public that he was bisexual, crashed his car going 100 miles an hour to end his 24-year-old life. So they grabbed for the good life, the, the worldly life, the fleshly life the life they were lured into, no doubt, by Satan himself. And how's that working out for them now? But you see, with spiritual adoption, when you commit yourself to, by believing and trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you lose those bad parents and you've got better parents. You don't pursue that bad life. You pursue a good and a godly life. You have freedom that lost people cannot enjoy. You have blessed assurance that lost people cannot enjoy. And you have promises that lost people can never know. The text here, Paul says that when you're spiritually adopted, you're no longer given to a spirit of slavery. And that's, and that's where lost people live. They are enslaved by their lust for the world, by their lust for their own flesh, and by the, the wiles and the schemes of the devil. But when you become a believer... By grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and you experience spiritual adoption, you're now freedom. You're not a slave to sin anymore. You're free to know and to love and to serve the living God. I believe in free will, but I believe it's something the experience that only really Christians can know. But before you become a Christian, your will is in bondage. And what the gospel does is it frees your will to know and choose, to love and obey God, to worship him publicly, to worship him privately, to be his disciple, his follower, to fellowship with other Christians, to do ministry in Jesus' name that benefit other people, and to join the Bible's call to be preaching the gospel and supporting gospel preaching all throughout the world so that other people can become spiritually adopted by God. You've got a life that's so much better when you accept the better parentage of spiritual adoption. You've got blessed assurance. I haven't met a lost person yet, and I've known plenty. I used to be one, and I still know some and care about them. And I haven't met a lost person yet that did not deep down in their soul fear death. They may accomplish great things in life, but all of them fear death because they know time's going to run out. And they don't know the Lord, and they usually don't know any other kind of religious pursuit. They just live for now, for the world and for the flesh, and, and, and they fear what's going to happen to them when they die. But if you've been spiritually adopted, you have what the great hymn writer Fanny Crosby calls blessed assurance. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit, the text says, that you are the sons and daughters of God. That blessed assurance is not for hypocrites. And blessed assurance is not for nominal Christians, Christians in name only, who never darken the door of a church except maybe Easter or Christmas. Blessed assurance are for genuine Christians, born again by the Spirit, adopted by the Father, who engage with all their life in spiritual things, worship and discipleship and other things that we've been talking about. But it's a better life. It's a purposeful life. It's a meaningful life. You've got better parents, you've got a better life. You don't have to fear death. You know you're going when you die. And oh, the longevity of your life if you're spiritually adopted. you got much better parents. you got God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. You live in a much better, meaningful, purposeful life, and you've got a much better destiny as well. Spiritual adoption. Better parents, better life, better destiny. You see, because glorification is forever. The bottom line here, the theme throughout the eighth chapter of the book of Romans is this that we suffer with him, share his passion for life, share his sacrifice in life. If we live that kind of life, then our legacy is this, we may also be glorified with him. 
Spiritual adoption is synonymous with glorification. In the Greco-Roman culture from which it originated, and it stands true in every culture up to our present culture as Americans, adoption is more binding than natural birth. In almost every culture, you can take measures to disown a natural child. You can have them legally removed from your family. You can do that. Heaven forbid you would want to, but you can. However, for 2,000 years, when you adopt a child, that child is yours permanently. In other words, once adopted, always adopted. Once an adopted child, you're always a child. You can't get rid of them. And so spiritual adoption is when you come by the grace of God to be adopted in his, his family. When he adopts you, he makes a promise to you that he will never, never, never let you go. You are his, and all that is his is yours for absolute eternity. That's better parents. That's a better life. And that's a better legacy through spiritual Adoption. Now, I noticed that we, uh, I noted that we honored our adoptive families this morning as well. We should, uh, but I told you I wanted to introduce to you one more that may be somewhat of a surprise to you. I never shared this story for many years because as long as my parents were living, I thought it might be off putting to them, and so they've both been gone now for a long time. And God's given me the freedom recently to tell my story of my. Adoption, twice. In 1961, my mother was a teenager just out of high school who found herself pregnant. And being pregnant in the Deep South to a poor family in the early 1960s was not a good life to look forward to. The person who had impregnated her found out about it, and he literally ran away running out of town leaving, never to be seen in those parts again. And my mother, being in a desperate situation, didn't know what to do. Fortunately, in 1961, the government didn't give out free abortions to poor families. If they had, I wouldn't be here. But still, what a dilemma. Her parents were poor. Her parents were angry. They had no money to support her, let alone her and a child. And so in a desperate attempt to get the birth father to come back and what we used to say back in the day, do the right thing. She tried to find him by contacting his roommate at the time. And this man who was his roommate actually did what the lesser man would not do. He wound up marrying the girl and taking away her shame. And when that baby was born in Waycross, Georgia in 1961, on the birth certificate on the line father, it said, Charles Franklin Devane Sr. He gave me a name that I otherwise would have been a bastard. He gave my mother a home where otherwise she would have been destitute. He did not legally adopt me, as it were, but he paternally adopted me and gave me a better parent, a better life, and a better legacy than I ever would have had otherwise. And really, I owe all of that to my second adoption, which happened in 1982 when I became a Christian, when I repented of my sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It was in January of 1982 that I became what I'm advocating for you today. I became spiritually adopted, and God became my father, a much infinitely better parent. And I've lived a life as a Christian and now a pastor for 33 years. It's been a good life, and I look forward to what's to come. And I know what my legacy is, too. When I leave this planet, whether it be tomorrow or in 40 years, I know exactly where I'm going. I'm going to see my father. I'm going to see my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm going to live as a joint heir with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever through the grace that is spiritual adoption. I highly recommend it. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, thank you for the great grace of spiritual adoption, which your servant Paul presents to us in this paragraph in Romans. Uh, of all the comforting paragraphs we can read, 
And that great chapter, that great book, and none are better than this. What a grace it is to be loved by you, to be claimed by you, by your sovereign power as our eternal parent. You chose us before we ever chose you. You loved us before we could ever love you. You sacrificed for us, and we make no sacrifice to be your children. It's all grace. It's all a blessing. It's all a wonder. I pray for these worshiping here today that they might have all found themselves spiritually adopted too at some point in their life. I see much evidence in this crowd, and I thank you for their souls and their salvation and their adoption that they've experienced. And I pray that if there's anyone here who's never surrendered to Christ, that they themselves will become spiritually adopted even today as we continue in worship. In Jesus' name, and all the church said, amen. In response to the preaching of God's word, we confess together and we commune together. Our confession of faith today is short from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And let's read together and learn from this question and answer. Question 11. What are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing of all his creatures and all their actions. Amen. Now let's pray together the prayer our Lord taught his children to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, and we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our deacons are going to come now to serve the Lord's table. And as they come, would you please bow your heads and close your eyes for just a small moment of personal worship. And you make your own personal prayer and confession to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Adoption, as our earthly parents can testify, is costly. It's sacrifice, it's love, it's cost. But then again, so is our spiritual adoption. It cost our Lord Jesus Christ his life, a life that he freely gave on the cross for us, which we commemorate each Lord's Day in Holy Communion. The bread is his body, nailed to the cross for our sins, and this we do in remembrance of him. And the wine is his blood, poured out on the cross for our forgiveness, and this we do in remembrance of Christ. And as long as we eat this bread together and drink the cup, we proclaim the gospel of Jesus until he comes for us. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Please stand now for our closing hymn and remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 151.
Please bow now for the benediction. Now, Heavenly Father, take these precious souls here in this place who have gathered for to worship you and bless them and keep them and make your face always shine upon them. Fill their lives and other lives this week through theirs with your grace, mercy, and peace. For we go now in Jesus' name, amen.